It was early afternoon. I'd been studying for several hours, so I decided to take a break. And as I often do in those kinds of situations, I turn on the TV to catch the latest news and then go back to studying. Only last Tuesday when I did it, I turned on the TV, I saw a Texas size strategy, the likes of which I couldn't even imagine. I was stunned. I sat there reacting emotionally. I teared up. Think of it. Some kid shoots his grandmother in the face and then goes to the local elementary school and kills 19 children and two teachers. It was unimaginable. What was going through his mind? What would make him do a thing like that? What was his motives? And then the pundits came on. The politicians gave their view. And I was eager to hear what they would have to say. And most of them talked about, what do we have to do to prevent this from happening in the future? And as I listened to them, I heard things like, we need more laws. We need less guns. We need more money. And while all of that may have its place, I sat there and thought to myself, what, what, what insight can we gain from the scripture about all of this? What does the Lord think about something like this? What are all the ramifications? And then I decided, maybe, maybe I should speak on this Sunday. Now, we've been going through 1 Samuel, but I've interrupted series before. And then I started thinking, well, where would I go in the scripture? And I started looking, and there are several things that came to mind. But for some reason, none of them quite clicked with me at the moment. I even talked to a couple of friends of mine about the situation to give their reaction to it. And those conversations helped. But I still wasn't sure what I should say. This is so complicated. There are so many different factors involved. I've spoken on mass murder before and considered some of those. But for some reason, this one just struck me different. So out of frustration, I decided to maybe not speak on this. Let's go back and look at 1 Samuel, the next chapter, and maybe just speak on it and just pray diligently for the people. And then I looked at 1 Samuel chapter 5. And to my surprise, I had done the spade work on the passage before. I had all that done. But as I looked at the passage in light of what had happened this week, I thought to myself, huh, there's an insight here. There's an insight that we need to know that comes from this passage that relates to a Texas-sized strategy. 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 Now, I want us to look at 1 Samuel chapter 5. So open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. And while you're doing it, I want to make a comment. As a pastor, as a teacher of the scripture, it is my job to teach you how to think biblically. Now, I assume after that you learn to respond biblically, but what is critical is that we learn to think Biblically, Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. I want to glean from this passage an insight. And the purpose of which is just to give us a biblical perspective on things. Now, what I'm going to do is go through this passage. And then I'm going to go through another passage in the New Testament. So when I get to the end of this passage in a minute, we're not done. We're going to go through a second passage but there is the principle here that I want us to see. And then there's some ramifications of that principle that apply to us who are sitting here and listening to these truths. So with that in mind, let's start with 1 Samuel chapter 5. And you are told in verse 1, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Now, if you've been following me as we've been going through 1 Samuel, you know that the ark is the little cedar chest-like thing that was in the tabernacle. 
And it's where the very presence of God was. It was a symbol of the presence of God. That we now know, prior to this chapter, that the Israelites and the Philistines were in battle. And in their brilliance, that's sarcasm, in their stupidity, the Israelites took the ark from the tabernacle and brought it to the battlefield. They lost the battle. And the Philistines get the ark. Now all of that's been told to us before. What this verse is telling us is they took the ark from the battlefield and they took it to Ashdod. Now you need to know that in this particular time in history, the Philistines occupied part of what we call the Holy Land and they had five principal cities. Those are spoken of in the Old Testament several times. One of their chief cities was Ashdod. So they took the ark to Ashdod. It was 33 miles west of Jerusalem on the Mediterranean coast. Now, they had a god there, a pagan god, an idol. And that was one of their principal deities. So they took the ark representing the God of Israel to Ashdod, where there was one of their gods. Now look at verse 2. It says that um, they were, uh, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of dragon and set it up by dragon. Oh, man. They captured the ark, and to add insult to injury, they take it to the temple of their pagan god, and they put it in the temple of their pagan god, as if to say, <laughs> our god is bigger and more powerful than your god. Your god is going to have to submit to our god. That seems to be the attitude. Well, their god was the God of harvest, the one that promised to give them a bountiful harvest. And so they were very proud of their God. Someone has said the Philistines set the ark beside the image of dragon, thinking them equal. Bearing the ark like a trophy of conquest, they took it first to the temple of dragon at Ashdod. There they laid it at Ashdod's feet, or I mean dragon's feet or tail, as though the dragon was victor and the Lord was his prisoner. Oh, what a stupid mistake. Read verse 3. Then the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, and there was dragon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took dragon and set him on its place again. You know, there are times when I think the Lord really has a sense of humor. The way he handled this is he took this pagan idol and he's in the ark, or rep that ark represents him. And so instead of him being at the feet of the dragon or the ark being at the feet of the dragon, he just let the dragon fall on its face and be at the feet of the ark. That'll show you. So the Philistines come in and they see the dragon fall flat on its face. Now that is a significant little uh, statement. It is associated with worship. So falling on your face is we've now got their God worshiping the Israeli God. That'll show you. Uh, furthermore, they had to set it back in its place. You mean your God didn't do that on its own? Your God couldn't do that. So that's what's going on in this passage. Now, look at verse 4. And when they arose early the next morning, uh, there was dragon falling on its face in the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of the dragon and both the palm of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only dragon's torso was left of it. <laughs> The Lord's going to really communicate this message. In the first place, you're going to lose your head. You think your God has wisdom? His head is off. And his hands are off. You think he has power? Well, let me show you. 
our God just decapitated and cut off the hands of your God. So they're sitting there looking at the situation and realizing their God didn't have the wisdom or the power that they thought they, he did. Now, what I want us to do is put this into the context of the book. This is important. That is, and this is very important to understanding what's going on here. The Philistines clearly understood that this was the God of Israel. They clearly understood that this God had given the Jews victory before. So how do you know all that? Well, I read chapter 4. I want you to look at chapter 4 and see what it says. In verse 6, now when the Philistines heard the noise, that is the, they're shouting that the ark had arrived, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us. We will, uh, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians and with all the plagues in the wilderness. What? You knew about that? That happened 300 years ago. So they knew a bit of history that the God of the Israelis was alive and powerful. On top of that, they just saw what he was able to do with their God. My point is simply this. They knew, they knew there was a God called the God of Israel. They knew that God was powerful. They knew about him. Now let me pause here for just a second. We think we have a corner on the truth of God. Well, let me tell you, God has revealed himself to everybody. Not everybody sees the revelation, but God has revealed himself to everybody. In Romans chapter 1, it says the invisible things about God, things you cannot see, are clearly seen. Isn't that an interesting statement? Things that you don't see are seen? Not a contradiction? The things are clearly seen by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now what that verse in Romans 1.20 is saying is simply this. Any human being on the face of this planet ought to be able to look at creation and say, there is a creator. That doesn't take a PhD. As a matter of fact, that might hinder you from seeing that there is a creator. That there is a creator and you should be able to look at creation and figure out that there are some things about him. You can figure out, for example, that he's powerful. That's what the verse says. Even his power and Godhead. Now, there are different ways to understand the word Godhead, but I think it at least includes intelligence. So could you look at the world and think whoever put this here has intelligence? The illustration I've often used with college students is I hand them my watch and say, let me tell you what I know because my watch is in your hand. I know that somewhere in this world there's a watchmaker. That makes sense? Let me tell you something else I know. Whoever that dude is, he's got more brights than I do because I can't make one of these things. And I look at the universe and I say, there is a God and he has power. And more intelligence than I do, I can't make one of these things. What I'm simply saying is, at this point, they knew God was in their midst. So the question is, how do they respond to that? Well, look at the next verse. Verse 5 says, therefore. 
neither the priest of dragon nor any who came into dragon's house tread on the threshold of dragon in Ashdod to this day. Now here's what they did. Talk about brilliance. Uh, here's what they did. They said, wow. What we have to do is not step on the threshold. We'll just step over it. And they started it that day and they continued it until the day this book was written, which was many years later. Did you ever play the game stepping on the crack? When you were a kid, did you ever play the game where you didn't step on the crack in the sidewalk? Raise your hand. All of those, I now know your age. All right. <laughs> Uh, all right, that, that's the kind of thing they did. In response to all of this, we're just not going to step on the crack. Maybe that'll help. Isn't that brilliant? Talk about the ultimate of stupidity. They, they should have recognized there was a God in their midst. He's demonstrated it to them in history and in the present and they should have at least said, you know, maybe we ought to consider this God. You think? You think maybe? Now let me tell you, that's exactly what happens in Romans chapter 1. Listen to this passage. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and the unrighteousness of men who suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. Here's what people do. I said a minute ago, God has revealed himself, right? Yes. And, what is, and, and so what do they do? Do they accept the fact that there's a God and seek him? He said, if you seek me, you'll find me. Do they do that? No. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Did you catch that phrase? That is a description of what's going on in America right this minute. The vast majority of people are suppressing the truth of the God of the universe and they are doing it in unrighteousness. That is exactly what happened in 1 Samuel 5 and it's exactly what's happening today in America. All right. Now, let me tell you, when God reveals himself and people have that kind of a response, there is a result. So I'm now going to describe to you the result of this city not acknowledging God. That's what's going on in this passage. We're not talking about an individual. We're talking about the whole city of Ashdod. No individual is mentioned. It's the whole community, and they're not acknowledging God. All right, here's the consequences. Look at verse 6. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. He's making a point out of the fact we're not talking about one individual that rejected God. We're talking about the whole community, the whole city, and all the territory around it. But here's the result. They were struck with tumors. Uh, nothing at this point is said about those tumors. But because of some things that are said later in the book, which we'll get to later, there are people who think this is probably the bubonic plague that that was the kind of thing they were dealing with. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure, but this I am sure of, they experienced some physical consequences of disease directly related to their <coughs> not acknowledging there was a God of Israel. So what happens next? Well, in their brilliance, we are told in verse 7, and when the men of Ashdod saw it was, how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is ha harsh toward us and dragon our God. Would you look at that? 
they acknowledge now that the God of Israel is alive and doing something, that he's more powerful than their God ought to have occurred to them. And what they said is, he's too harsh for us and he's harsh on our God. So what we're going to have to do is get rid of him. Uh, by the way, these, these, this is the intelligentsia of the city. This is the, these are, I assume, the leaders of the city. Right? So they get together in the legislature. And they, they said, okay, well, we're going to solve this. We just get rid of this God. In their brilliance, this is what they did. Verse 8, therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered and said, let the ark of the God of Israel be carried to Gath. <laughs> what? Listen, let me tell you what's happened to us. So we're going we're, we're gonna, we're gonna to do is we're just going to send it to a sister city. Gath was one of the five principal cities of the Philistines. How would you like them for a neighbor? That was about 12 miles down the road. So uh, evidently, the men of Ashdod, and for that matter, all the leaders of the Philistines believed uh, that maybe he, the Lord was un, unhappy with just Ashdod. So let's send him to Gath and see what happens. What they should have done was recognize the God of Israel is alive and well and powerful. But they chose not to do that. So look at verse 9. So it was when they had carried it away to the land that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction and struck the men of the city, both small and great, tumors broke out among them. Now, same thing happens in Gath. Only now he uses the word very great destruction. Not just destruction, great destruction. Not just great destruction, very great destruction. So they get the tumors, the disease, and on top of that there's some other kind of destruction, I guess, going on. But what is interesting about this verse is that it says, uh, the hand of the Lord was against them and he struck the men and tumors broke out. That little expression, broke out, is only used here in all of the scripture. And it refers to the groin. So some have suggested that this just may be a reference to hemorrhoids. Or again, because of other things that are said, that this is a possible reference to the bluebonic plague. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian that lived in the first century during the time of Christ, wrote about this, and he said that the plague struck people with uh, vomiting. So this is not a healthy scene. These people are suffering devastating consequences simply because they didn't acknowledge the Lord. So now what do we do? Well, look at verse 10. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Akron. Oh, this is so brilliant. So it was that the ark of God came to Akron. The Akronites cried out saying, they have brought the ark of the God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So the people of Gath decided we have got to eliminate this God. This God is bad news. We've got to get rid of him. So we'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just send him another six miles down the road to uh, Ekron. And when the people of Ekron get there, they say, you have sent us an instrument of death. Now, if you observe the text carefully, you'll see that at Ashdod, there was disease. At Gath, there was destruction. And now at Ekron, there is death. All because they didn't acknowledge who God was. And all they would have had to have done was that. So verse 11 says, so they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines. All right, guys, we've got to have another meeting. 
The last law we passed didn't work, so we've got to get together and pass another law. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. Get the legislature back off their retreat, their vacation, their spring break. Bring them back. We've got to have another meeting. We've got to have another law. So this is what they did. They sent, uh, so they gathered and sent to all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout the city and the hand of God was very heavy there. Well, they finally came up with some better ideas, I must say. So the citizen of Ekron didn't fare any better than Ashdod and Gath. And so they said, you know what? Maybe we'd all be better off if we just sent this little thing back to Israel. At least maybe we wouldn't be suffering all of this destruction. So verse 12 says, And the men who did not die were struck, uh, were, uh, were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So, apparently, from putting things together throughout the book, this happened over a period of seven months in three cities. And yet they refused to bow before the God of heaven and experience his mercy. They only experienced his judgment simply because they would not recognize, acknowledge him, trust him, submit to him. Rather, in their stubbornness, in their pride, they just decided to eliminate him by sending him to another city. So what I want you to see thus far is simply this. When the Philistines did not acknowledge God, they experienced devastating consequences. I want to repeat that. This is the little insight that I gleaned from this passage. When the Philistines did not acknowledge God, that's all they would have had to do. They recognized him, but they did not acknowledge him. They eliminated him with the result that they experienced devastating consequences. Is that in this passage? And what struck me as I looked at this passage in light of this week, as I mentioned a minute ago, it wasn't an individual we're talking about. That happens later. We get to Goliath. This is the community. It's not just the city. It first says the city and its territory. And then it says all the Philistines got together. This would be like saying it happened in a city like Los Angeles. And it spread to the state of California. And finally, the city of Los Angeles didn't know how to handle it. They sent it to San Diego. San Diego sent it to San Francisco. And when Sacramento couldn't figure it out, they said, hey, we got to get Washington involved. Does that sound familiar? Did you listen to the reports this week? That's exactly what was going on. And we are living at a time when as a country, we are not acknowledging God and we are suffering devastating consequences. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am well aware that this is more complicated than that. I think there are other factors involved. I've spoken about them before. I think this man is responsible for his actions. I think we could talk about some things that contributed to this. I was rather fascinated by one report I heard that it's always, in the recent memory, it's always young men. It's always men, not women. They're always loners. You know the profile. One of the things I picked up this time, I hadn't 
heard before, at least it hadn't registered, is that in the, several of these cases, several of the most severe cases, they were under, their, their, in one case, the one in Florida, they did an autopsy and his system was filled with marijuana. And this fella is known to be used marijuana. That it affects the brain. Interesting. So there are other factors. In many of these cases, in the majority of these cases, there's an absent father. So there's the, there's the breakdown of the whole family that we could talk about. All of that is true, and I'm not denying any of that. Okay? I just wanted you to get a total biblical perspective. I think there's a side of this we need to look at, and that is the spiritual issue. And the spiritual issue is this country is no longer acknowledging the God of the universe. They did at the beginning. They at least acknowledged there was a creator. Even the deist acknowledged there was a creator. But we've, we've gone way past that and we have eliminated him. And I submit to you there are devastating consequences when a society, not just an individual, ceases to acknowledge God. Now that brings me back to Romans chapter 1. Would you please turn to that passage of scripture? Romans chapter 1. Now look at verse 21. Because though they knew God, and in this context that simply means they knew about God. They did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile, futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. What an interesting verse. As I've explained, the first couple of verses says God has revealed himself in creation and they suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. And now it is saying in this passage that even though they knew about God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were they thankful. But and this is what happened. It affected. Affected their thinking. Did you see that? When you don't acknowledge God, it affects the way you think. As a matter of fact, uh, in this verse, the word translated thoughts means just that. To reason and to think. Feudal has the idea of vain or useless so their reasoning process is useless. They can't think straight. They're filled with darkness, not light. That's what the text says. And that's what I want you to see. That when a society, not just an individual, when a whole society fails to acknowledge God, it affects the way they think. Ah, matter of fact, it says they became fools. Who became fools? The wise. Did you see that? That's what the text says. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. It's interesting. It often seems that the most educated ones are the people who have the less common sense. We're one of the most educated countries in the world. And it, we're filled with folly. And the ultimate folly is idolatry. Yeah. We worship some other thing than God. So verse 23 says, They changed the glory of, of the incorruptible God into an image likened to corruptible man, birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. They changed. The Greek word means exchange. They, in place of God, put other things. So they worship the creature rather than the creator. They replaced the incorruptible with the corruptible. They had the temporal instead of the eternal. The earthly instead of the heavenly. They got everything backwards. They lost the ability 
to think straight. That's what this passage is teaching and what 1 Samuel 5 illustrates. The current version of stupidity, folly, stupidity in our country is that there's only one gender and that men can give birth. You ever heard of such a stupid thing in all your life? Somebody needs to stand up and say, for crying out loud, enough is enough stupidity. When a female representative in the House of Representatives of the United States ask a female Harvard graduate Supreme Court nominee, can you provide a definition for the word woman? She replied, I'm not a biologist. Drop your pants. I'm telling you, somebody needs to stand up and scream their head off. You've left God out and you can't think straight. Send the ark to the next city. Get rid of God. And that is exactly what this country has done. Do you detect a little anger? A little bit. This one really got me. Let me tell you what the Supreme Court did. The Supreme Court said you can't pray in school. Not even a non-denominational harmless prayer that acknowledged God. That's all. Any religious person could have subscribed to it. They decided you can't have the Ten Commandments in school. They're etched in the door of the Supreme Court. You mean to tell me you can have the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court, but you can't teach children ethics and right and wrong? You got to teach them they can choose their own gender when they're five years old? Oh, I'm telling you, the issue in this country is we've left God out and we can't even think straight anymore. At least wait till they hit puberty for crying out loud. Uh, let me tell you what God says about this. Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. And prudent in their own sight. Write that verse down. Isaiah 5.20. And remember it every time you watch the news. I have a friend that I talked to thinking about what to preach today. And he said, I think of this verse every day. He's mentioned that to me before. And he's sort of gotten me to remember it now. <laughs> That's it. They call good evil and evil good. They call light darkness. What's happened? When you leave God out, you can't think straight. That's what's happened. And there are devastating consequences to that. Look at verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness for the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves. God didn't give up on them. That's a translation that didn't quite communicate what's going on here. He gave them over. In other words, God said, you want to go your way? I'm going to let you. And what are you going to do? You're going to go in the way of folly. That's what you're going to go. When you don't think like God thinks, you're going to end up in stupidity every time. I told you I felt strongly about this one. Let me tell you what I think. What I think is we've become a secular society. That's what I think. If you know anything at all about the history of this country, you know that it was built on Judeo-Christian values. Secular historians say that. 
that this is never a Christian nation, but it was a nation made up of Christians. I remember growing up in the South where everybody went to church on Sunday. Stores closed on Sunday. You remember that? You wouldn't think of doing some things. If you got pregnant out of wedlock, you left the state. Remember that? My point being, there was a sense of right and wrong that we have lost. Now, why have we lost it? Because we have lost acknowledging God. You see, my whole point in 1 Samuel 5 and in Romans chapter 1 is that when you leave God out, when you don't acknowledge him, when you try to eliminate him, it affects the way you think and you end up doing stupid stuff. I'm not done. <clears throat> so why am I telling you this? Oh, there are some reasons. One is, I think it is imperative that we as believers in Jesus Christ think biblically. There are several passages I could go to to talk about all of this. But this one hit me because of 1 Samuel 5. That there is a community concept to this. That our culture has been infected. When I first moved to California... And that was 40 years ago. I was told that Washington tells you what you must do. Hollywood tells you what you must think. God help us. And that's where we are. It gets peddled through music. So we live in a secular society that's eliminated God, that's eliminated the spiritual, and certainly eliminated the Lord. And I mean by that Jesus Christ. So part of the reason I'm doing this is to simply make the point that it is imperative. It's important that we learn to think biblically. Because if you don't think biblically, if you don't include what God says about something. then you're going to end up being conformed to the world that's left God out. And you'll end up doing stupid stuff as all of us have done when we left God out of the picture. So it's important that we think biblically. But let me give you another suggestion. You remember Sodom? What did God do to Sodom? Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. Abraham said to Sodom, if I could find 50 people, would you spare it? And you know what the Lord said? Yes. Well, now let's negotiate. How about 40? Remember the story? Now let me tell you what I think. Biblically. I think God has spared this country because there's still 50 righteous people that know him. I didn't say they were perfect, but they know him. So you want to save this country? And walk with the Lord. That's one of the things we ought to get out of this. I think we may be the reason God hasn't absolutely judged this country worse than it's going to happen in the future. So it's all the more important that we not be conformed to the way they think. And we be conformed to the way God thinks. And therefore we act accordingly. Now, let me put this down in very specific terms. We live in a day, we live in a secular society where the whole issue is look good, feel good, instead of be good and do good. Does that not sum it all up? Well, let me add something to it. 
The issue is not to look good. The issue is not just to feel good. And I'm not opposed to either one of those things, you understand. The issue is not just be good. And the issue is not just do good. The issue is to be godly. And to live a godly life. So it is imperative that we think biblically so that we can live godly lives and help spare America. God help us. Let's pray. Father, we pray for those hurting people in Texas. We pray for our country. We need awakening, Lord, a spiritual awakening. We need another movement of your spirit on this country. And Lord, that begins with us. So help us not to be deceived by the thinking of the world or be caught up in the lies of Satan, but to think your thoughts after you so we can walk in harmony with you Lord, give us that kind of wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.